This video we're going to be covering chapter 7, section 3, which is using chemical formulas. Now chemical formulas, as you'll remember, uh, list the elements and relative abundance of those elements uh, within a certain chemical. Now these chemical formulas list these elements solely on an atomic level. For instance, it would be very hard for you to go to your lab table and measure exactly two hydrogen and one oxygen and mix them together to get water in a certain reaction. So what we're going to be doing is using these formulas as tools for relating them to measurable uh, quantities. So the first real quantity we're going to be relating these formulas to is mass. So if you look at your periodic table, you can see that hydrogen has a mass of about 1.01 atomic mass units, and oxygen has a mass of about 16.00 atomic mass units. Now what you can do is you can take each element and its relative abundance and then add these together to get the total mass of one molecule of water in this case. So if we have two hydrogen atoms, which weigh 1.01 AMU per hydrogen atom, you can see that the number of hydrogen atoms cancels and you end up with 2.02 AMU, which is the mass of two hydrogen atoms. And you can calculate the molecular mass of water by adding together the same process for the single oxygen molecule. So if you have one oxygen molecule times 16 AMU per molecule, you get that oxygen has a weight of 16 AMU, which is of course a fact, but I thought I'd go through this process because it's the same for all molecules and formula units. Now if you add them together you get that water has a molecular mass that is molecular mass of 18.02 AMU. Now you can properly call this a molecular mass because water can be separated into individual molecules like this. If you were to take NaCl however which is an ionic compound, you could still use the relative abundance, which would just be one for each, and multiply by the AMU to find the total mass of one formula unit, which would be the formula mass. However, you can't properly find a molecular mass for an ionic compound because, if you'll remember, they're linked together in sort of arrays like this, where each one is adjacently bonded to the one next to it. So you can't ever properly separate just one formula unit. Similarly, we can use uh, the molar mass of various elements, which we learned about back in chapter three, uh, to calculate the mass of each molecule or formula unit. So for example, if you have, again, let's use water. If you have one mole of water, which again is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd uh, molecules of water. You need two moles of hydrogen and one mole of oxygen. Now you can use the known molar masses of each of these elements to calculate how much a mole of uh, water would weigh. So let's do that mathematically right now. If you were to have two moles of hydrogen, which weigh 1.01 grams for each mole of hydrogen, you multiply that out, you get 2.02 grams, because these units cancel, are due to the hydrogen within the total mass of the water. And then you repeat the process with the oxygen. You take one mole of oxygen times 16 grams per mole. These units cancel out. Now it's very important to write the units because you'll be able to check your work that you're doing the process right by having all the units cancel out so you get the desired result over here. And you end up with 16 grams, which, to no surprise, ends up to be 18.02 grams is one mole mole of water. 
Now you'll notice that this number is numerically the same as the uh, formula mass in atomic mass units. And this isn't just a coincidence, it's true for all elements and compounds that an element's molar mass will be numerically the same as its formula mass. Now the molar mass is a very useful tool for chemists because it enables you to switch between various units whether you need them for calculating a reaction or for measuring the amount you need for that reaction. For example, if you needed 2.5 moles of oxygen gas to react in a reaction, uh, the problem is you can't count out all those individual molecules of oxygen. So what you need to do is find how much it weighs in grams. And the way you do that is by using the molar mass as a tool. So what you do is you would first calculate the molar mass of this molecule over here. In this instance it's very easy. It's just two moles of oxygen times uh, 16 grams per mole of oxygen. Again, it's two moles of oxygen because it's O2. So you get twice as much oxygen because they're both linked together into one molecule. Again, the units will cancel correctly and you'll get 32 grams is uh, per mole of O2. Now what you can do is you can take this factor, which you've just calculated, and use that to find out how much 2.5 moles of oxygen gas weighs in grams. So you take 2.5 moles of O2, then you multiply by your conversion factor, that is 32 grams per mole of O2, and you notice you have to use the right factor, because if you don't, these molecules will be different and they won't cancel out. But in this instance they do, because we've done it correctly. And then, once you do the math, you get 80 grams of oxygen gas is how much you need for the reaction. And this is much more measurable than the 2.5 moles that we were given originally. Similarly, you can go backwards if you're given a number of grams and you want to go to moles or to the number of atoms or molecules. You can do that, again, using this as a conversion factor. So let's take uh, ibuprofen, which is C13H18O2, and this is the stuff that's in Advil and other generic pain relievers. And if you take the relative abundance of each element, that is, the number of times it appears in the molecule and multiply it by the atomic mass units, etc., or rather the uh, its molar mass, you get that it has a molar mass of 206.31 uh, grams for each mole. And this is a very important factor for what we're about to do. Let's say you had 33 grams of, I'll just write C13 for short, and you wanted to get how many moles that would be. So what you'd do is you would multiply this factor, making sure that the units cancel. So right now in the factor, the grams are on top right here. However, you need to cancel with the grams that are already on top right here. So what you do is you flip the factor. You put the moles of C13 on the top, one mole for every 231 grams. And once you do all the division, you end up with about 0.16 moles of ibuprofen, which I'll abbreviate as C13. You could even then take this factor, or this answer rather, and multiply other factors, like for example we know Avogadro's number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules in every uh, mole of substance. And you can calculate the number of molecules you have within 33 grams of ibuprofen. Or alternately, you could take this 0.16 moles of C13 and calculate how many moles of carbon you have contained 
within these molecules. So you take the 0.16 moles of C13, and because there's 13 uh, individual carbon atoms within each molecule of ibuprofen, you would have uh, 13 moles of individual carbon atoms, that is, without a subscript, for each mole of ibuprofen, which again I'll abbreviate as C13. And you'll see the units cancel, and you end up with 2.08 moles of carbon. It's also very helpful to be able to know the percentage composition uh, by mass of a certain element within a compound if you're trying to extract that element and use it for something. For example, if we had copper to sulfide and you wanted to know, you know, how much of this compound is copper by weight and how much is sulfur, what you would do is you would take the molar mass of copper. First of all, you have two moles of copper. Then you multiply by 63.55 grams per mole of copper. And when you cancel, you get 127.1 grams of copper. And you do the same thing for the sulfur. 32.07 grams per mole is the molar mass of sulfur. Again, the units cancel, so you know you're doing it correctly. You get 32.07 grams of sulfur. Now what you can do is add these two masses together to get 159.17 uh, grams of the copper 2, or rather the copper 1 sulfide. That's the total mass you have within one mole of this compound. And then to calculate the percentage by composition, or the percentage composition by mass, rather, of the copper and the sulfur, all you do is find the ratio of the copper and sulfur, respectively, to the total. So let's do the copper first. You take the 127.1 grams of copper, and you want to see how much is, of that is in uh, 159.17 grams of copper two sulfide. So you can see it's a ratio problem. You're going to take these and what you'll end up with is a decimal 0.7985 and that's the ratio of copper within the compound by mass. But what you do to find a percentage is you simply multiply by 100. So this compound would be 79.85 percent copper by mass. And you can do the same thing with the sulfur obviously and you get about 20% of the mass is from sulfur.